All right, we are live with uh, another legendary statement analysis guru, Peter Hyatt. I don't know if I said it yet. I don't know. New tongue, I'm just breaking it in. How are you doing today, Peter? I'm well, thank you. It's really good to have you on. Now, I'm assuming you're already familiar with the couple other guests that I've had on, Mark McClish and Avinoam Sapir. And have you done any work with either of them? Yeah, I've I've learned from both. Um, both are well respected. Okay. Okay, and am I wrong? I think Avi Noam. I don't know. I'm not gonna say he invented it, the system, but he kind of brought a lot of this over here from Israel, right? He did, and I think he did an, an excellent job of um, laying out all the basic principles for analysts to follow, um, which yeah. allowed. Uh, others to build on that work. So it's, it's a solid foundation of, of what he brought. Well, awesome. Now, how has it changed over time? Well, language itself shifts. Mm -hmm. And so um, in my dad's time, he might say something like, um, he was pitching woo at a great tomato. <laughs> and he was talking about my mom. And right. pitching woo was trying to be charming or flirtatious and a tomato in Brooklyn, New York, was a uh, a good looking girl. Okay, we say so woo. Use a so you can imagine analyzing that today. <laughs> well, yeah, it definitely could be interesting. Now, how did you go about or get into statement analysis yourself? You know, I'm asked this a lot, and I, I usually give the same answer about being naive and not mm. wanting to be deceived decades ago. Um, but I was thinking more about it today. And when I was a boy, um, one of my favorite book series, besides the Hardy Boys mystery books, was called Encyclopedia Brown. Mm. And that was where you had to read carefully, and within the words, there would be a clue to solve the mystery. And I loved it. I loved it, and then I soaked those up. And so eventually that, that led to training. And, um, and then I think around 2001, I received training from the Muskie Institute through uh, the University of Maine uh, on investigating child abuse cases. And the training was excellent. Um, it was it locked you up in a hotel for five straight weeks and um, it was something special. But in particular, I learned legally sound interviewing. Okay. And when you're interviewing a child, uh, you can assume nothing, you can interpret nothing. <laughs> Excuse me. No problem. Uh, one second. It's like your microphone took a dive. Um, all right. As everybody doing in the chat, it is live. Lisa Franceschi. I'm going to take this off. Yeah, Lisa, a lot of people haven't been getting notifications. I'm not sure what to do about it. I think it's a, a curse of YouTube. It's actually even happening to like Viva Fry. And I mean, he, he's a giant channel. It's really, really, really frustrating to not know if ever people are going to see it or be able to show up. Or I'm finding out from people who are getting notifications like seven days later and things like that, which is really, really aggravating. Um, Back. Oh, huh, good to see you. Let me see. Busha Busha did not get a notification. Sorry to hear that. That's All okay. right. So what, what was the noise? Everybody wants to know. It's starting off with a bang. <laughs> oh, that was Heather misbehaving. No. Ah. no. I was saying about the um, legally sound interviewing. Uh -huh. It's actually something that's both incredibly boring and incredibly fascinating at the same time. Incredibly boring in the sense that to do a legally sound interview with a child, you must ask the most simplest of questions, you interpret nothing. They have to interpret everything. And the questions are generally almost always open-ended. Mm -hmm. So um, that can be, it. if you watch a video of it, it is incredibly dull. It gets information like nothing else. So what happened for me in uh, about 2001, 2002 is the two schools of understanding came together. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do legally sound interviewing. Excuse me again. Sure. 
ठीक है ना थैंक्स Alright. So notifications are regional. That's interesting. Um <laughs> sorry, that will be our last interruption. She's got it under control there. Okay. Um so the two schools came together, and what it meant was that legally sound questions, open-ended questions. Mm -hmm which um, had the least amount of influence upon the, the subject, the recipient, the, the child in this case, the child that's you, allows for them to give out information that is very likely to be reliable. It's, okay. it's difficult for any of us to lie uh, directly, mm -hmm. especially for a child. They get yes or no questions are easier to lie to. Um, leading questions, did you take my wallet? I didn't take your wallet. It's easy to respond that way by parroting. But when someone speaks on their own, it's very difficult. And so when a child is asked, tell me what happened, mm -hmm. and the child might say something like, and there's some hideous responses, but uh, I played Monopoly mm -hmm. with Daddy Bob. The only proper question to follow up with that is, what is Monopoly? What is Monopoly like? How do you play that? You know, question to question. And you learned, um, and I say, I say you, meaning a universal understanding across the nation, is that child predators will change language. Mm -hmm. So when um, Uncle Bob gave her a special snow cone, mm. the question is, tell me about a snow cone. What does a snow cone look like? What does a snow cone taste like? And then you find out the, the real meaning of how Uncle Bob changed the words, that child. So that's a legally sound interview. Statement analysis, when blended with that, called analytical interviewing, is so powerful that it's able to gain admissions at a higher rate than anything else. And it holds up in court. Because uh, even challenged by a, a defense attorney, um, I'm only using the subject's words. Mm -hmm. One of the examples I give with that is uh, when Bill Clinton said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Sure. He very likely would have passed a polygraph had he been asked, did you have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky? Right. He couldn't pass the polygraph because he had a specific definition of what sexual relations was. Mm -hmm. you now, most people don't share that. If, if they had said before the, before the polygraph, the imaginary polygraph, what is sexual relations? And he describes it, and he still right. tries to deny it. He's going to fail. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very careful. Polygraph examiners with good training will know not to ask leading questions, not to ask questions that we the, the subject has no familiarity with. Mm -hmm. If that great salesman do that, they repeat our words back to us because we're comfortable with our own words. Sure, and it's a disarming effect on it. But in terms of being legally sound and Gaining information, there's nothing like it. Okay, now on that, um, you had mentioned using it in court. Now, technically, from what I understand, just like the polygraph, it's not admissible in court as statement analysis itself, correct? That's correct. It's not admissible as a science unto itself, but it's used in court all the time. And mm -hmm. the techniques are defended by um, the Supreme Court many years ago, ruled on the read technique something very similar. Okay. So statement analysis is a general term. It's like math. Mm -hmm. And then there's specifics within math. So different schools will have different um, discourse analysis, forensic statement analysis, all different types of names to describe it, but it's basically the same thing. It comes down to listening and believing someone until they talk you out of it. Okay. So that's... That's our presupposition. It's not a moral or ethical exercise. What it means is understanding human nature. We don't like to lie outright. We don't mm -hmm. like to tell a, a fabrication of reality. Therefore, if I'm going to deceive you, 90% of the time it's going to be by me withholding information. Sure. And so when we look, when we listen and look into those words very carefully, 
we look for where a subject will skip over time, for example, will um, have some type of awkward pause or sensitivity indicators around a topic that we know is missing. So if the, um, if the context is something very simple, a child has gone missing, mm -hmm. we have expectations that we listen for from every parent based upon parental response. So some will say, hey, that's not fair because you don't know, know how you would react if your child went missing. And that's not true. The data is overwhelming. When you go to a supermarket, for example, and your child wanders off, you call after that child. That's what you do. You don't mm -hmm. continue shopping. You look for the child. We expect the exact same thing when the child goes missing. And when we find a parent who is calling 911 and doesn't seem to help the flow of information, and when the parent is interviewed, doesn't seem interested in finding their child. Hmm. That is the unexpected that we deal with. That makes me think um, of the oath that people take before court, that it's actually pretty elegantly yes. put. Um, tell me nothing, uh, you know, tell me the truth, then the whole truth, and then nothing but the truth. And... It, a lot of statement analysis, you know, judging from what I've seen from you, what I've you know, seen from Abby Noam, Mark McClish's book, things like that, it, it, it falls right in that category, right? It's like, first, here's the statement, is the truth, but is there anything missing? So that's the whole truth part, is do you have anything missing? Or um, as Greg Hartley likes to say at the behavior panel, um, chaff and redirect. Do you deal a lot with that where somebody will, you'll ask them a question, and you'll get, why would I ever do something like that? I don't even hardly know the person. When someone asks a, a question as a response to a question, we mm -hmm. right from that point, we know the question itself is sensitive, but we're asking. But when someone goes into a monologue and then they begin to ask questions, that is where we listen the most carefully as we can, because that's where we get our information. They're often floating it to see what kind of reaction they'll get. And it's, mm. it's, often an indicator of guilt. Are they fishing? Are uh, they fishing from you to see what you know? Yes, or or it could be from a television audience as well. But those mm -hmm. questions are critical, the ones that they ask during an answer. I'll give you I'll give you an example of that kind of comical was um, the Boston Red Sox pitcher Roger Mc, Roger Clemens. Mm -hmm. um, he was accused of taking HDH, human growth hormone. Right which in low levels would mean um, almost like an anti-aging type of drug where he would be sleeping better, uh, he'd be losing body fat, uh, his skin might even look better like Hollywood uses it. But in baseball, with the brutal motion of a pitched baseball, he would heal faster and recover faster from workouts. Mm -hmm. And he pitched very at a high level at an advanced age. That was surprising. Right. So he was asked um, on this, and he gave testimony. And then it, as his confidence grew in his own deception, he said, well, if I'm getting HGH, I wish the person that was delivering this to my house would come forward. Because, <laughs> you know, how am I getting it? He asked, how mm. am I getting it? Who's bringing it to my house? So now we knew it was going to be delivered to his house. Mm. Um, and then the man that delivered it to his house came forward. Said, <laughs> That's me. Wow. So we always listen very carefully. Um, Is that that embedded confession I think you've talked about? It can be. If the words they use are not ascribed to another, I'll mm -hmm. give you an example I used with the, the Madeline McCann case. is very powerful. If I said, you said that I stole it, that's not an embedded confession. I stole it is not an embedded confession. Even if you think, I say this, you think I stole it, that's not necessarily an embedded admission either. Mm. But if someone is speaking and not ascribing words or thoughts to anyone else, mm -hmm. well, we must have hidden the body incredibly well, Kate McCann said. Mm -hmm. And she's mocking um, an audience by saying that, but she's floating. That's an embedded admission. It's very powerful. Okay. Okay. Um Really quickly, because I want to get um, some chats in. Somebody asked this a couple times, but how do you recommend that people learn statement analysis? Any books that you recommend specifically? It is something that I think requires formal training. 
Um, books are interesting about it and, and they can be entertaining. But when it comes down to um, real learning, to enroll in a course um, is the first step. The second step from that, enrolling a course and learning the principles, which you can pick up a lot from blogs and from, from good books and articles, but peer review is working mm -hmm. with others. Mm -hmm. um, it is essential to eradicate error because we all have prejudices. We all come to the table with sure. uh, preconceived ideas. And um, so, for example, I meet with a team of expert analysts uh, twice a month from the United States, Canada, Western Europe, Italy, sometimes Russia, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. Um, we meet once a month, usually at the request of law enforcement where we're analyzing a statement for them. Mm -hmm. But they bring such amazing diversity mm -hmm. and amazing backgrounds, things that I don't think of, ways I don't think. Um, right. We have one with has a, a mechanical engineer's brain, for example. And I don't think like that. Um, okay. yeah. We have an, another a medical doctor. I don't think the way she does. We have social sciences, we have law enforcement, we have law enforcement, some of them with decades of experience investigating. Uh, so they all bring something different and unique. So what I do, even after all these years, is that when uh, I'm requested to analyze a statement, say for example, um, a murder case or a shooting case where a law enforcement contacts us and says, could you take a look at this? Mm -hmm. I don't look at it, I'll, I'll pass it off to one of my associates because when I go to lead the team, I want to go in completely cold. Okay. All I want to know is what's the allegation? And I'm going to let that statement speak for itself. So I put myself on the line because that's the way to learn. Mm. The, the, ironing that, the iron that sharpens iron uh, is an effective tool. So the principles they learn like in a course are taken to that type of setting where they learn from others and, the, and they find that um, the other analysts are very encouraging and, and give strength. Another thing we do is we don't jump. Mm -hmm. We ask questions of the statement. We'll say, why is he saying this particular word? Whereas sometimes someone's new and they'll say, well, this guy's definitely, he did it, I can tell. Well, how can you tell? I ju I've just seen enough of these type. And sometimes their instincts are good. That doesn't count for us. That is not good enough for us. You have to submit to the principles first and practice that. So I always say to, to new analysts, when you've analyzed your 100th statement, for example, mm -hmm. it's almost as if something takes over where you begin to almost dissociate from your own emotions and feelings and background and give yourself to the statement, enter into their language. A lot of them say afterwards and they, and they solve cases is, I just want to take a shower. I want to wash them off me. It's, it's just so gross because they got so deep into his language. And I'll give you an example of how deep this gets. The team has an excellent track record of identifying anonymous authors. Okay. And this is probably the, the, the pinnacle of what we do is someone writes an anonymous threatening letter. Mm -hmm. um, if we're able to identify, say, seven out of 10 of that writer's attributes, personality, background, what he really wants, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. More times than not, the person that received the letter knows who that is. Sure. How often do you, do you determine whether it's actually a threat or not? Yes, the threat assessment analysis is part of that. Um, and that can be anything from, sadly, a suicide note mm -hmm. to a threat against someone else. At a case okay. where... Um, Resource suicide note whether it was the person who actually wrote it. Sorry, not only that, but it, is the person going to commit suicide, especially when you can't the person can't be found. Right. So um, resources are, are it's so it's so sad in law enforcement today, but resources are limited, mm -hmm. and so there's only so much manpower they can put on any any given case. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, when I was asked about a suicide note. Is this kid, and, and I guess he was probably about 20 or 21, is he serious about committing suicide? So I analyzed it very quickly and said, he's committed. 
he is committed. And the Missing Persons Bureau said, well, um, we have so-and-so from the FBI here. And he says, no, this is a, a call for attention. This is not a commitment to suicide. He said, he's going to commit suicide. You've got to find him now. And regrettably, I was right where they found him and um, he had shot himself. Hmm. But he linguistically committed to that. Now, anything can change in time. For instance, someone that's so committed to committing suicide, something good happens and it distracts them. Or someone is not so committed and something goes wrong, like a, a, a humiliation, and they mm. go through with it. The same thing with a threat. The threat analysis is at the particular moment of time. It's not 10 minutes later. So if someone um, is committed to committing this crime, they're, they're going to harm someone. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes later, they get into a car accident. It doesn't happen. But at the time of the writing, we look for that commitment. Okay, and that's yeah. what lets us know. One thing, um, like uh, having Evan Noam on, he doesn't even want to hear a word. He wants everything in transcripts. Is that the way you guys work as well, that you don't try not to listen to anybody, you just get it in writing and then really parse? Um, that's a luxury that we, we love, but we can't always have. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as I've discouraged other analysts from doing what, what's called discourse analysis, just active listening, um, some of them are very good at it. And if they concentrate, for example, on pronouns, they can do quite well. Now, I had a case of uh, a young woman who alleged rape, um, who had some terrible physical deformities. And um, she was in a wheelchair and it was just one of those cases that were heartbreak. It was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And as she spoke about it, and I, I could feel myself getting a little teary. And that's how it was when I was interviewing her. I heard her use the word we after the alleged rape. And I said, that's it. You know, I, I let her speak on. And later on, I spoke to my superior. And I said, um, he didn't do it. And she said, how do you know? I said, because she used the pronoun we, which means unity and cooperation. Mm. Whereas what rape victims do, they'll say, you know, we went to the store, we went to the movies, we went mm. out together. Once the rape takes place, is he did this to me, he did that, he and I drove back. It's never we again. It, the mm. assault is just too severe, too intrusive, um, both physically and psychologically. So the word we is not going to be there. <laughs> my superior asked me if I was willing to put my career on the line over a single pronoun, because this had been a particular case that had a lot of attention from the world of politics, mm -hmm. which is never good. And um, I said I was. So she had said, how do you want to approach this? And I said, well. Can you describe the case, or is this the same one? The same case. Okay. Okay. This Can you is a, explain what happened just real quick? I, a sexual assault um, in an empty movie theater. Okay. And she had said, um, you know, he raped me. And um, then we drove home and I called 911 and I cried. And after the rape, she used the word we. Right. And I was just listening. I, you know, I, I actually at that point stopped taking notes during the interview. Yeah. That's all I needed to know. So um, I was asked, how do you want to approach this? Because you have an advocate, you have a, a, a medical, medical records in this, you have, you, know, you have a lot of people involved in this and politicians are looking at it and they're gonna jump on things. And um, I said, well, I think that she should be confronted in like a therapist's office or something because mm -hmm. I don't know how she's gonna react, but I, I'll, I'll do it. So when I said to her, when you told me that he raped you in the movie theater, you weren't truthful. She said, how do you know? And so I explained what the word we means and how it's used. And instead of her being suicidal or getting wildly upset, she said, well, he broke up with me. Mm. That was her justification. She was willing for, I don't know, 19 or 20 year old kid to go to jail because he broke up with her. And that was the end. Well, wasn't her first answer a tell too when she said, how do you know? 
Yeah. Well, Jimmy I mean, versus saying that's not true. I mean, that, that's it's like, well, if somebody answered with that, I would immediately say that's a very odd. Now, can we go into pronouns a little bit? And I think you have another example you've used before about the word my um, doing it like it's my um, so like bodies in my house or something like that. Yeah. Um, just to break down on what you're looking for with the pronouns. If um, someone listening were to just give themselves the pronouns, just that's the only part they study of speech, mm -hmm. um, they would do pretty well with detecting deception. Just pronouns alone. It's that amazing. We learn as humans in the English language, we use the, we use the word I millions of times. Mm -hmm. We're really good at it. We are efficient at it. Um, the word my may even predate our speech. Little kids, if you have a little kid, they, they use their hands and go, my, my. Mm -hmm. um, we, as humans, are possessive creatures. We take ownership of what is ours. Um, and if something is, is vile or bad or um, not ours in that sense, not belonging to us, we don't like to take responsibility for it. So if someone says, well, for those of you that believe in my guilt, using taking possession of the guilt, I don't argue with them. I believe them. When someone says it's my guilt, it's my guilt. Interesting. Okay. I think the parents are, are usually pretty good about this with teenagers that drop pronouns, the pronoun I. They oh, you mean like went to the store, da da da. Yeah. Didn't do anything after school. Finished my homework. Okay. So you ask, why are they dropping the pronoun? Why are they psychologically distant themselves from doing homework? For example, it could be they didn't do their homework at all. It could be they rushed through it and did very shoddy work. But there's a reason why they're distancing themselves. Now, this leads to a whole new world of analysis in the sense of emails and text messages. Because mm -hmm. text messages are by nature abbreviated. Right. I was going to say, there's also, there is a custom with some what people just be like, yeah, came home, went to the mall, did this, did that. And they'll drop pronouns just when talking. Like if you're talking to somebody and you're not asking them direct questions or anything, they're not necessarily being deceitful if they're just lazy. True. And the context is always going to be important. So what happens is let's say someone, yeah, I guess got home, got home from work, got dressed, you know, like that. And they're dropping all their pronouns. Pay very close attention the first time the pronoun I appears. It's now important. Okay. So now it's the reverse. Okay. Yes. So you're looking at someone's baseline. Um, another example is in verb tenses is that a commitment is I went to the store on Friday. It is 90% or more likely to be true. I went to the store on Friday. Um, I go to the store on Friday in the present tense. There are some people that, when you listen carefully, who, um, and I think some of them may have uh, Irish backgrounds known for storytelling. And, I was and lyrical. Say yeah. There's some who will do that. And sometimes they'll do an entire truthful statement in the present tense. Right. Right. But generally speaking, we, um, we're not going to count that as a good commitment. And the context, especially in a criminal context, you're accused of something. It's really important that you commit to where you were, what you did, who you were with, and what happened in the past tense by connecting that. And when we don't have that in that context, um, we often have indicators that something is wrong. Now, how do you do – I'm um, you know, friends with the behavior panel and all the body language stuff, and one of the biggest things they have or they talk about is a baseline because – Nothing means anything unless it's a deviation from the baseline. It, I, I, that'd be the best way I could put it. I don't want to be too far off. As you described here, some people talk a certain way. I was thinking about uh, pronouns and how you might have a really fun time if you're getting into the whole new accepted pronouns when you have the binary or I'm non-binary and the and they and them and zim and zers. And that can get really confusing in of itself. Or another example, I don't know if you've ever run across it, but a writer, for example, someone who writes fiction might go against statement analysis in the sense that they don't like to use the same word over and over and over to describe something. They won't say car, 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 car. 
they might just by their nature always be changing up to say, I drove my car to the store and my Mazda, you know, there was my Mazda in the parking lot and, and it got hit by the cart that was going down the thing. In statement analysis, often that's seen as odd because it's changing the descriptor, I guess you'd call it. How do you feel about that? Um, two things. It's not actually odd in the sense that um, when a, a Mazda becomes a car, for example, um, if you ask questions, which I get to do in interviewing, mm -hmm. if you ask questions about the Mazda, you might get different answers and different aspects of answers from the car when you use the word car. Mm -hmm. You might be more proud of the Mazda than you is of the car, but something in reality has changed, even if it's subtle or slight. It doesn't make it inappropriate. Um, in fact, oftentimes it's a signal that someone is telling the truth. So if I say I, I drove my car down 95, it broke down, I left the vehicle on the side of the road. When I pick it up, it's not going to be a vehicle. It's going to be a car again because it's working again. When it wasn't right. working, it became a vehicle. So a reality changed like that, and it's often a sign that someone is telling the truth. The time when someone trips up a little bit is if they're absolutely fabricating reality and they're not keeping track of their words, which is, is stressful, difficult. So sometimes we'll get that. In terms of a writer in fiction, he's deliberately trying to do that. Um, no, but I know, not. but I'm just saying that they think that way. I mean, you know, I, I'm around, you know, some creative people, storytellers or whatever, and just by their nature, they're never going, they're always going to be changing it up. Same way as that first person, you ask them anything, and they'll be like, oh, there I went, there I am. I'm talking to such and such, and this jerk goes, blah, 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 you know, and they almost embellish and they're not necessarily being deceitful. They're being directionally true. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it does. And, and as a matter of fact, that gets me in a lot of hot water usually because um, there are different forms of deception and we have to decide whether it's appropriate or not. For mm -hmm. example, a doctor who can't reveal someone's medical records, um, he's mm -hmm. going to be withholding information and it's going to show in his language. So he's going to show as deceptive. And in a sense, he is, he's withholding information that he's thinking about, but he can't say it because of HIPAA laws or confidentiality. Right. Um, we get that in military intel. There's things they can't tell, like things they can't talk about. So mm -hmm. what they're doing is as you're engaging them, they're thinking about what they can't say. Right. And that's really difficult. That puts a pressure on them. So I, I'll note, for example, I, a business negotiation, a car sales negotiation. Um, this person's being deceptive in the sense that he's not telling me everything. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what he's not saying, but I know he's not. He's withholding something. Um, during a negotiation, if I want to get uh, 10 from you and I'm pushing for 12, I don't really want 12. I want 10. Yeah, you're anchoring. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's kind of natural. There's also the bravado and, and sometimes the dramatic flares of exaggeration. And those can be very humorous. That can be appropriate or inappropriate. Um, it will depend upon context. Everything changes when someone's under an allegation. Right. Or you don't want to look bad. And this is where I want to kind of go with it because the McCann's case, um, you're famous for, and you're not a fan of the McCann's, I would say. It's probably an understatement of the year. However, it is a weird situation because, for example, I had the behavior panel. They cover the mechanics too. They're pretty much top in their field as well with um, body language analysis, things like that. And they looked at the first interview and they were saying that they were not being deceptive in that interview. So it's not often that I have, you know, a, such a direct, you know, um, difference if you will, you know, normally people kind of agree or they're, you know, overall in the same, there may be slight differences, but that is like a direct contradiction. Is it possible that they're lying for another reason or they're lying out of shame? Like, um, I, I'm going to go hypothetical because I never know legalities, but if let's say I'm a shitty parent and I'm neglectful and then something happens to my kid, but I don't, I don't want to reveal how neglectful I was. Could I be being deceptive, but yet not guilty of committing a crime to the child? Well, you're supposed to ask me, hey, have you ever been wrong in here? Oh, I'll get there. Okay. But go ahead. <laughs> um, so there was a case of a little girl that went missing. 
Mm -hmm. And the father spoke and the father was deceptive. Right. And it ended up that a, a sex offender neighbor killed her. So I, I thought, you know, this was not difficult analysis. Where did I go wrong? I went over it. I had others go over it. And no one could find the error and finally got cleared up for me. He was deceptive about how she got out of the house because he was high on drugs, an attendant crime. Mm -hmm. It was neglectful, which led to her death. So he was protecting himself by being right. deceptive, but he didn't right. do it. And so what we do is we, um, McCann's gave us a lot more information. This was a short interview. What we do is um, we can conclude that the person is not telling all they know. They're, they're not being truthful. They're being deceptive. We may not know exactly in what area they're being deceptive, but it has to do with their missing child, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So not pinning the, the guilt of having killed the child on them. Right. But for example, um, the McCann case wasn't a difficult analysis. It wasn't something that was, I know it was well received, but it wasn't something that was terribly challenging. There were signs of deception in abundance from them. And the guilt they had was regarding her disappearance. And they had already, in their language, had already processed her death. They knew that she was dead. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that they killed her. I'm saying they have knowledge of her death. And they are being deceptive about the kidnapping. Now, could it be knowledge that is told to them by law enforcement that they're not allowed to reveal themselves? Because that, that was a specific uh, statement that I know did come out in the questioning when he said, I'm, um, I wouldn't, would not, I'm not going to answer that. I can't, can't answer that, but I'll say no. Or, or something like that. You know, and it's like, I know sometimes there's a, a little um, back and forth of law enforcement where you're not supposed to share every freaking thing out there. Is, yep. is that and, a possibility? And not in that particular case. I'll tell you what, my, my little girl's missing. Mm -hmm. I don't give a rasp patootie. Here's what you need to know. I've got to find her. Everyone in the world can tell me to shut up. I will not shut up. I'm going to find my daughter. Okay. Uh, and think of the, we, we weigh this against human nature and parental instincts. Mm -hmm. So looking at Madeline, when she was a baby or any of us, when I had a little boy and he cried, I picked him up. Mm -hmm. When he was wet, I picked him up and handed him to his mom to change him. When sure. he was hungry, <laughs> I fed him. Right. Um, when he fell and hit his knee, I put the Band-Aid on. Mm -hmm. Dad did this over and over and over every day for years. Mm -hmm. Suddenly he goes missing and I am left with a feeling of impotency like never before. The frustration is through the roof. My parental instincts are inflamed. True. What I care about is who has him, what condition he is in, is he giving um, my son food? Does he have a warm jacket on? Does he realize that this is his favorite teddy bear? Mm -hmm. My concern is just him and finding my son. That's the expected. That's what parents do. That's a parental instinct. Solomon exploited that. He knew that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was the first statement analysis, I think, according to um, several of you guys. Yeah, it, it's um, he, he used human nature, parental capacities for protection and provision mm -hmm. to draw that out. And so what we have is a body of literature that shows um, and countless number of cases where a child went missing and the parents, the innocent parents, always focus upon that child and anything they can to get that child found safe. Mm -hmm. What you had with the McCanns was no interest in what Madeline was experiencing. None. None of what she was going through. Now, does that make them sociopaths? I don't think so. I know some people think that and some people I respect think that, but at least from what I did in the interviewing, um, in the analyzing of the interview, was they were in self-preservation mode. Mm -hmm. So how is it possible that they could get through an interview without expressing any concern, unless it's fed to them by an interviewer, any concern mm -hmm. for what Madeline was experiencing at that very moment in time where they couldn't pick her up, change her, feed her, put a Band-Aid on her? Mm -hmm. The only way to, for a parent to get through that is to have processed her death. She was beyond their help. And this is now this is a personal opinion of what I think they did. I think they told themselves that if we tell the truth of this 
unintended death, this accidental death, mm -hmm. they're going to take our other kids away. And we can't help Madeline, but we can the other, the twins. Okay. So, and, you know, and you know what? They can, like any parent, they can take me to court. Mm -hmm. I get to ask questions. I get mm -hmm. to face my accusers. And I'm willing. Okay. Now, on that note, actually, because you had mentioned so sociopathy and in that, um, you have been interviewed and talked about another case, uh, Nathan Carmen. And I think he got tried for being responsible or irresponsible leading to his mother's death, ultimately. And some people suspected him of possibly killing his grandfather over an inheritance. Suspected, I'm not saying he did or not. You know, yes. Alleged, alleged, alleged. Um, people were talking about how he had Asperger's. Now... I've done some reading on it that there, the line between autism and Asperger's is a, a branch of autism from what I understand, or a variant of it, um, kind of a lighter case, if you will. And um, psychopathy aren't that far apart. Like there, there, are some, there are some parallels there. They're not the exact same thing. Is it possible that he was a sociopath and not Asperger's? Maybe. Um, I did note he was low affect, um, very low on emotion. He was deceptive about what happened to his mother. Um, I think the case the, the case you're, you're talking about is a civil case where his, his aunts, his mother's sister, brought against him. Yeah, no, but yeah, let's go back to it. I guess uh, he went out boating with his mother, and um, the boat capsized. Something happened. He was rescued ultimately by the Coast Guard. His mother was found dead later. Um, from the moment he called the Coast Guard for help, he was deceptive. And then he did an interview, and this is where I analyzed it for 2020. He did an interview with, with 2020 uh, in which he was also deceptive and manipulative. Mm -hmm. Very intelligent, um, but the, you can tell the of the it's – like, it's like a low affect of emotion for mm -hmm. him with the Asperger's. Now, uh, did he kill his grandfather? His grandfather was very wealthy. Um, a millionaire mm -hmm. and um, police felt very strongly that he did. Right. Um, but but I, I didn't have enough to sit, to draw a conclusion from my profession. Mm -hmm. I have an opinion on it, but for my profession, I couldn't say uh, with certainty. I could say for, with certainty that he deliberately killed his mother. Oh, okay. It, when the, when the grandfather died, the mother and her sister uh, inherited the money. And when mother died, he got it. And that's what the, the suit was trying to stop that from him getting that money. So hmm. um, it's not, in terms of law enforcement, it's not a mystery. It's not a mysterious case. Um, it's one that they have to be able to prove in court. And sometimes these professionals work day and night on a case only to go up against a DA who refuses to prosecute. Mm -hmm. The DA is not generally trying to stick it to the cops. Um, the DA feels he has to prove it, he prove it in court. Doesn't want to miss that. And there and there can be well, also, they get one shot. Yeah, this, I mean, uh, in fairness, they do get one shot. If yeah. they get it wrong, then that's it. They're free. Yeah, it's very difficult to go back into another another type of of um, you know a, a, another allegation against them, another indictment. It's very difficult to do that. Um, now, there can be times where a district attorney feels that an investigator did a very poor job, and there can be a time when uh, an investigator feels that a district attorney is cowardice um, sure. for political reasons. Sure. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of that here. So uh, a baby went missing, and um, the biological father had been watching the baby, and the biological father said, that um, someone kidnapped the baby. Mm -hmm. So police went in and they found no trace DNA, a number of people in the house, uh, everyone shutting up and no one cooperating, but the father wasn't speaking. And so the, the mother, who didn't have the child at the time when the child went missing, sought to provoke the father into speaking publicly. 
and the father um, said, well, you know, if um, Nancy Grace should come up to Maine and, and walk, uh, walk in my shoes from the Nancy mm -hmm. Grace show. And so Nancy Grace sent a producer up there <laughs> to go and walk in his shoes and he wouldn't answer the door. So when he was accused of, of hiding, he came out and, and made a quick statement to the, the police, uh, excuse me, to the public. Mm. He wouldn't speak to the media when his child was kidnapped. He wouldn't speak, reach out to her. He wouldn't speak to her. He wouldn't speak to the kidnapper and humanize mm. his daughter. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. He, he said, I'm not emotionally capable. This is a man speaking. I'm not emotionally capable of speaking at this time. So, mm. which is like, you took your daughter to the supermarket, she went missing. Instead of searching for her and crying out for her, you went home, made a little meal, maybe had a, a snack, took a nap, and then you know, you'll get around to looking for her when you get a chance. But right now you wanna just take care of things for yourself. This is, this is what he took. Mm -hmm. So he went out and made the statement. He said, contrary to rumors floating around out there, I have been cooperating with police. And though that simple sentence, contrary to rumors floating around out there, he used that word floating because that baby was floating in water, very likely a Kennebec River here in Maine. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what happens is I don't want to. Now, was the baby you found me. eventually or? No. Was, no. Oh. Did he uh, he's eventually? still not prosecuted. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And, and it makes the family crazy. And um, law enforcement has to maintain a, a certain professional distance from it all, but they know as well. There was no one that entered that. And so finally, law enforcement did did push some buttons, which I thought was very well handled. They said that there was a trail of blood from the basement up the stairs in his truck, the baby's blood. And, you know, I, I have strong feelings about the, the nature of that case, that it should have been prosecuted. But when um, when national spotlight falls upon a case, you'll get some lawyers that come out of the woodwork who are high-powered, high-priced lawyers mm -hmm. who will do it for free for the publicity. Okay, mm -hmm. That can be very intimidating to a young new ADA sure. who, may, who could be assigned a case. And there's sometimes there's uh, long-standing uh, district attorneys who have been there forever, who've been passed over by the private sector for decades, and they don't want to go out and be humiliated. And so sometimes justice gets swept aside. It's very difficult to bear. So there's a lot of human elements there. Cops make mistakes. DAs make mistakes. Okay, let me go to the chat for a few so we can get some uh, questions in here. Um, I've heard about this and I haven't seen it. Um, I'm so, can I ask about themes in statement analysis? For example, door opening relates to molestation. Water refers to sexual assault. I, I've heard about this. Is that something you're familiar with? Sure. Um, for example, if someone says uh, about opening a door that is not necessary to say, like when you enter a building, you have to open a door. Mm -hmm. So it's unnecessary. We don't reinterpret to meaning some form of sexual abuse. We ask, why is this person telling, having the need to say they open the door when it's unnecessary language? And so one of the things we'll explore for is the possibility that that person had been sexually abused in childhood. So the, the natural question is, why would you think that? And uh, this is called an event of hormonal consequence. When a child is molested, their hormones rise. Mm -hmm. And the child may be too young to understand and bring those levels down again through understanding. So if you were driving a car and you begin to hydroplane, that's a scary thing. Mm -hmm. You work the wheel tightly, your hormone, you can feel a hormonal flush right through your body. Sure. But then when you realize you're okay, you talk yourself down or reason yourself down intellectually and you ease up and the hormones recede. Mm -hmm. Elevated hormones and the impact upon the brain, the hormonal consequence, this is where PTSD comes from. They don't go down quick enough. So it can leave with an extremely sharp memory a sensory memory. And what might that kiddo remember later on is that horrible sound of a door opening, the doorknob turning. And so it stays in their language forever. One of the, um, the examples I cite with this, because we get it fairly routinely, mm -hmm. is in the 
uh, the John Benet Ramsey case. John Ramsey was talking about um, the finding of John Benet in the house. Mm -hmm. He said, I opened the door, turned on the light, and there she was. So three points. So he opened the door, and then he turned on the lights. Instead of just saying, I found my daughter in the closet, he slowed it down to say, I opened the door, I turned on the lights, and then there she was is passive. It doesn't assign responsibility. The kidnapper or the killer didn't put her there. He's not telling us who put her there. Those three things together, along with everything else they, they said when they were deceptive, um, makes a very strong case against them. I believe that John himself had been abused in childhood. Hmm. That's what he was referring to. So with lights, lights often are indicative of energy, for example. So if someone says, um, you know, I'm talking about my day and I turned off the lights and went to sleep. It's not necessary. People don't turn the lights on to go to sleep. So the fact that it's not necessary to tell me they turned off the lights first, unless the context demands it, then it's, you know, you leave it alone. But I turned off the lights before we went to sleep, mm. being unnecessary information, it's important to him. So if it's important to him, it now becomes important to me. And what mm. we have found through lots of repetition is that it often indicates some form of sexual activity, lights going on being positive, or lights going off being a negative where uh, maybe he was expecting romance and it didn't happen or, or something went wrong like that. So we're not, we're not saying if someone says lights, there's sexual activity. What mm -hmm. we're saying is if lights enter a statement without a need. Yeah, they said that I brushed my teeth and then I went, turned out the lights and went to bed. Yeah. Um, exactly. We're going to explore that because it's unnecessary. Um, the brushing the teeth one is a little bit comical. Excuse me here. A little bit comical in the sense that um, the first time I had a case on that, I was investigating um, missing money from business. Mm -hmm. And it was a business of adults with developmental disabilities who had all been pooling their money together for an outing, something special for them. And um, all the employees had to write out a statement of what they did that day, whole day, when the money went missing. Mm -hmm. And I had told the, the owners, because the, the local law enforcement had finished investigating already, and so they had asked me to do it. And I said, well, um, did anyone else enter that building? Not to our knowledge. I said, if, if one of them did it, and they each write out what happened that day, we'll know who did it. Mm -hmm. And I came upon one of the statements where she had said um, that she got up, she brushed her teeth, got dressed, and went to work. Mm -hmm. um, very few people tell us that they brushed their teeth. This is an investigation regarding theft. And she wanted to tell me that she brushed her teeth. And mm. so I went to the owners. I said, you know, I'm concerned about this one. And they said, oh, she didn't do it. She would never steal money. I said, no, I'm not accusing her of stealing. But something's wrong. I said, what do you mean? I said, I wonder if she's a, a, a victim of domestic violence. And they mm. were shocked. And they looked at me like I was a genius. <laughs> I said, no, no. So why would you think that? I said, because she told me that she brushed her teeth and we all brush our teeth and we don't feel the need to talk about that. But people, uh, women in particular that experience domestic violence, they don't live basically with the violence. They live under the threat of violence. Mm. So when she gets up in the morning, they, they, they walk on eggshells around the, the abuser. When she gets up in the morning, I'm willing to bet when she goes to the bathroom, she locks that door. And for a few minutes, her life feels like it's her own. So that, mm. that grooming, the taking care of herself, is probably a, a time when she feels okay in life. Mm. So it's, it's a sign of domestic violence. So they, they say, wow, you know, it's amazing that you know that because we've been counseling her to get away from that guy, her boyfriend that she lives with. He's really bad. And... Um, but she didn't steal this money. I said, no, I'm, I'm not accusing her. I'm saying that something is wrong here. Has there been any other yeah. threats? And they said, yeah, um, nine laptops or something have gone missing. Hmm. I said, there it is. So what do you mean? I said, the boyfriend. The boyfriend bullied her into giving the key to get into the building. Him and his gang went in and, and cleaned it out. And it turned out that way? 
Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah, it, but it, it all turned for me, at least. I was able to point them and then uh, the law, local law enforcement in the right direction because she brushed her teeth. You mm -hmm. brushed yours, I brushed mine, but neither of us feel the need to tell each other. Hey, what did you do this morning? Did you brush your teeth? <laughs> it's not going to come out of our mouths. Um, but for her, it came out of her mouth, her tongue, or her pen, because it was so important to her okay, that it was yeah. part of her day. So that makes sense. So if I if I'm you know getting ready to go to bed and I'm brushing my teeth and I hear a shot, then it's very relevant. Yes, because yes. I was doing a particular activity and I've an association. Or something happened in the bathroom while you're brushing your teeth that was right. criminal. You know, then it was like now even in the in her in her position. I didn't reinterpret her words to mean domestic violence. Mm. I believed her. She brushed her teeth. I'm not reinterpreting those words. I'm asking why does she have the need to tell me that? Right. And that's what I'm looking for. But I'm not reinterpreting her words. So those are like just little indicators that are of great value to us as we're trying to understand what happened. In any case, we're trying to understand the person. Okay. Um, and here's one that I think that, I'm sure you've had before, but it's uh, can people learn to cover their deceptiveness by analyzing your methods? No. Once they speak freely, not me, not you, not anyone can keep it going for very long. We try, but we, we can't. Okay. Now, we're running lower on time, and I always put out, you know, for people in locals, everybody follow me on locals, on structure.locals.com. You definitely want to follow here. Had a question submitted from uh, Robert Barnes, uh, noted attorney. And being a noted attorney, it's a question you probably won't like. And I know about it already, but there's a ProPublica piece that's based on Aldert Vridge's work. I don't know if you're familiar with Aldert Vridge. But it's essentially a study that is done on statement analysis. He really picks on... Um, Avenue um, Sapir, but the basic premise is that statement analysis through the training is no more than 50% accurate. At I am familiar point. with it. Are you familiar with the studies? Yes. Okay. And, you know, I, I've got to always put both sides out there, and he is a lawyer, so you're going to have to deal with him. What are your thoughts on the study, or can you... Um, tell us what is wrong with the study and why it's incorrect. Yeah, and I, I think that it's not incorrect in the sense that um, he looked at, if I'm not thinking of the right study, because you know, it was done in the UK, one that, yeah, that showed- 2008, um, he wrote it in a book. I, I've got the book too. Oh, okay, so that's I'm, I'm in the right track here. Yeah. Um, they had two and a half days of training. Mm -hmm. Give me them for the same ones for three months or six months or 12 months, and you'll see much different results. It's, it's so much information to absorb in two and a half days that it will come out like basically throwing darts at a, at a, at a board just trying to guess something. Um, mm -hmm. What we have to do, it's um, in two and a half days, I can teach you all the scales on a guitar. Mm -hmm. You're not going to sound like Eric Clapton anytime soon. Probably it, ever. Takes, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of work. And so that's what we do is put them to work. The course that I offer... Um, it comes with 12 months of e-support mm -hmm. and go back and forth. There are people that have finished it in three months and they've not done well. Mm -hmm. But if someone goes slowly and does a lot of practice, they're going to do very well. And um, so in, in a sense, I do agree with him that it's just too much information uh, overload. But give me those same people. Let me train them for 12 weeks or longer, yeah. better, you know, better a year. And sure. they, and often with peer review, they can start after two and a half days analyzing, having their work checked, and use it in law enforcement immediately. Mm. Plus, I, I like lawyers anyway in general. They give me a lot of practice. Lawyers are, are fantastic because the way they think. I mean, they're all about pushing, your, you know, with critical thought and things like that. I, I think they're very good for, you know solidifying your opinion or point or anything else. They often become politicians too. 
yeah, but then that's when they take, you know, everything in spectrum. So they've got a dark side, <laughs> just like, you know, uh, cops can be good or they can be bad. It all depends. So. I've had some, a, a few good attorneys over the years. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, well, keep, keep in mind, you have an attorney on your side or the other side, whichever way you I work for some as, as some of my clients. I prepare mm. to work for them with the like, cross-examination, that sort of thing. I, I help with that. Well, and on that note, to give the uh, devil's due, and by the way, he points it out about uh, body language and other things as well, that there are problems. And one of my favorite stories is by Joe Navarro, who is considered one of the pr most preeminent body language readers in the world. And he talked about a woman who came in, they were questioning her as a possible witness in a situation. And, you know, he's in the FBI. She comes in and she's just acting just crazy, you know, really, really in an odd manner. And he makes a point of never saying deceptive, but just saying uncomfortable to him. Anything that's moving from the, uh, or deviates from the norm is a discomfort. And he's searching for discomfort. Why, why are they discomfortable? Well, he's looking at, it, he's like, what is going on? And so he asks the woman, she goes, I was running late and I didn't have much change. And I'm worried about the parking meter. And he was like, oh, my God, you know, it, all of her actions and everything else were, you know, completely misleading because they are legit in terms of parking meter, but not necessarily in the case. So a statement analysis, what do you have to watch out for that your own cognitive um, dissonance or bias doesn't get the better of you? That's one of the benefits of the um, endless hours of practice of, of this type of work. Let's say that um, I'm interviewing you and if the average person has 25,000 words in their head, in their, in their dictionary, their, in their brain, mm -hmm. um, someone like you, maybe you have 30,000. Mm -hmm. And if I ask you, what did you do this morning? You will go into that dictionary. You will decide which words to use, where to place each word in syntax, what verb tenses to use, what pronouns to use, all that together in less than a microsecond of time. Mm -hmm. If you need to disrupt that process, I got gotcha. you. That's going to be a sensitivity indicator. That's going to be a pause where there should be no pause. And mm -hmm. the other thing I was going to say, the point about the body language is what often isn't known is the effect, the effect of psychotropic drugs or medications upon the mm -hmm. person's body movements. It's, it's so uh, common today that someone is on some form of psychotropic that um, it can affect their movements and even their emotional responses. They still speak, and if they speak uh, with the the notion that they want to be understood, just like Nathan Carmen did in spite of Asperger's, when they speak with an expectation, I'm going to be understood, we look for those disruptions in the language, mm. and that's where we're able to, to pull out the information. Okay, and that troublesome lawyer's in the chat, by the way. He said, I think statement analysis like body language and handwriting is completely valid depends on the skill of the individual employing it. Yeah, I agree with them. And not not um, everyone possesses that skill. I'm not particularly talented. Um, I worked really hard. I, I just need more than others in terms of the hours. And, it, and uh, uh, it's been a, an addiction for me for decades, just constantly, constantly analyzing. And um, probably the greatest benefit is being able to have others review my work and critique it. But then we work as a team together and someone will see something that I didn't see. And off we go asking questions. One of the reasons we ask the questions of a statement is to avoid falling in love with our own opinion. Sure. If, if it can't stand scientific scrutiny, you don't want it. You don't want it. It's got to be criticized. I have a, a, a course almost ready on the language of addiction. The reason mm -hmm. I haven't published it yet, and I've had a lot of success with it, but the reason I haven't published it yet is because I need to present it to an audience of addiction experts who can shoot holes in it. What remains after they're done beating the, the devil out of it might be some really valuable information for not only investigators, but for therapists and psychologists. But I need it. I need it to be proven. I need it to be beat up on. So if I said to you, you know, hey, uh, you know, Eric, I know you don't like uh, 
you don't understand what's going on here. But if, if you don't agree with me, you're likely suffering from a phobia or you're mm-hmm. terribly immoral. So I've, I've now dismissed you with phobic and, and somehow pummeled you more, you know, you're, you're Hitler's cousin or something. Um, you wouldn't have any respect for my science. Right. Um, or the need to silence dissent or the need to censor others that have a different opinion. You wouldn't have respect for it. We call that the psychological wall of truth. You know, I know that you think I stole your wallet. I didn't take your wallet. And no matter what you say to me, I didn't take it. Nothing's going to change that. And so if an attorney grabs me by the arm and says, I don't want you speaking publicly, be quiet. I didn't take his wallet. Mm. There's nothing going to stop that. And, well, why should we believe you? Because I'm telling you the truth. And in fact, I don't care if you believe me or not because I didn't take it. Right. It's like this wall that goes between. And you, you'll hear it in innocent people. And it doesn't make the news often because it's boring. Mm-hmm. Um, they, the news looks for long statements, for um, unreliable denials. We like it straight out. Yeah, it's short. Short? Um, yeah, if you accuse me, no, I didn't do that. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. And you ask me, no. I, 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 I can't fill in details because I don't know. I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. I had a case like that <laughs> many years ago of a, a young male who alleged um, that he had been raped by a mm. male worker, 40-year-old male worker. And um, I was doing a joint interview with law enforcement where I called the suspect to set up the interview. And he had already heard about it from his job, the rumor that he had raped this kid. And so he said, I didn't rape him. I didn't touch him. And he was really upset, really worked up. But those words, in spite of all the bluster of emotions, those words were central. And there was nothing anyone could say. So I didn't schedule the interview and I called the, the, the law officer who was a couple hours away. I was supposed to drive to meet him. And I said, he didn't do it. And he said, you've got to be kidding me. How do you know that? I said, because he told me. And it, it sounds like I'm being facetious, but this was the truth. He said, well, we're on the way to the hospital. He's going through a rape kit. I said, that kid's not going to go through a rape kit. And I bet him a cup of coffee that wouldn't happen. And by the time the kid got to the, to the hospital, he bailed out. Mm. What had happened was uh, he wanted to have sex with an underage girl and the worker, the caseworker that was there would not allow the 15 year old girl to stay overnight. So he was really angry and bitter about it. Um, if we listen to people, they'll tell us they didn't do it in their own language, reliably and backed up by the truth. And then nothing's going to budge them. And I believe them. And that, that's uh, something that's actually quite helpful for law enforcement. Once they get that down well, to move on quickly because they are always pressed for time. They're always under undermanned. They always have a, a high caseload, especially today. Um, it's a great shortcut they can use. Well, that's perfect. And I actually titled this line with the truth because your thesis essentially is that people are telling the truth either way. You just got to pay attention to what's actually being said. Yes. yes. And, that, and that's something that's tricky to learn. And on that note, I'm going to be shutting down the YouTube stream and saying farewell and encourage everyone to go on to locals because I'm going to ask you another question that YouTube gets really touchy about. So I'm going to record it after and then it'll be on locals, but I will not put it behind a paywall or anything. So all you have to do is go to locals and follow me and it'll be there for free. And for now, everybody who just wants to stay on YouTube and move on. People can find you at HyattAnalysis.com. Yes. Is that a good point? Um, and you're also on Twitter as uh, Peter F. Hyatt, correct? Yes. All right. Well, Peter, thank you so much. And this has been perfect. Let's see.